agree totally with you about the amendment of the Constitution and how difficult it will be to amend the Constitution. I recollect in 2014, there was an attempt to amend the Constitution to change the date of voting to the first Friday in November. And my colleagues are here, if they recollect, it came to Parliament, it was put to a vote, and of course, it was vetoed. We didn't get the two thirds that was required to carry the, the, the vote. And I think there was also an attempt to amend the Constitution in relation to district assembly elections, which also never happened. I don't know whether we'll ever <laughs> be able to amend the Constitution. In relation to the Council of State, the issue of advice and consultation and um, the discussion around it, I think there's been a Supreme Court decision on the issue. And um, the Supreme Court stated categorically that when it says, the Constitution says there should be consultation and receipt of advice, that must happen. You must go, or the president must go for the advice and the, or the consultation. If he doesn't do that, that is unconstitutional. However, when the advice is given or when the consultation is made, that advice is not binding. And so the courts have settled down that already. With regard to local government <laughs> and the elections, Again, that will require, and if we are going to involve political actors, again, that will require a constitutional amendment. How we are going to achieve that, I don't know. But there must be some consensus before we even start the, the, the process. Distribution of funds or allocation of funds and uh, prosecuting um, people who do not release funds early. I'm sure many, 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 many public officers will go. <laughs> so we'll be prosecuted for that. I don't know how that works, because funds have never, ever been released time you see. And um, our, I mean, my colleagues Joe and Atachia, Ata, Honorable Atachia, we've always had problems with this issue, and it's never happened. But I agree with you. It needs to be released early so that um, assemblies can do their work and, and all that. The, in April 1992, by referendum, we adopted our written constitution as the supreme law of our land. The 1992 constitution, and as my um, learned senior Dr. Afrijan said, is resilient and the longest of all. This constitution establishes the three distinct arms of government, that is the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And it reaffirms certain principles, such as the principle that all powers of government spring from the sovereign will of the people, and the principle of universal adult suffrage, among others. It also establishes our democratic institutions, such as the Electoral Commission, the NCC, Chiraj, and I think we all know them. The topic for today is a very relevant one, involving three power blocks of our democracy. That's the Constitution, elections, and the judiciary. And it's especially relevant because we are in an election year. Ghana's reputation as an example of a thriving democracy, despite its challenges, cannot be questioned. Since the advent of the 1992 Constitution, we have witnessed eight elections, each aggressively and tightly contested by the two main political parties, the National Democrat Democratic Congress, which I belong to, and the New Patriotic Party. Three of these elections resulted in peaceful transfer of power from the incumbent government to the opposition, while in five, the incumbent was retained. This commendable record can be attributed to several reasons, including the credibility, particularly during its early years when IPAC was 
very functional, there was consensus building and discussion and all that. However, and um, the previous speaker alluded to the issue with public institutions. And he said it was a perception, but let me refer to some statistics. The Afrobarometer Round 9 survey in Ghana to 2022, conducted by the Center for Democratic Development, shows that the credibility of our electoral commission and the trust reposed in them by the people of Ghana has diminished. And why do I say so? The following question was put to the population surveyed, and I quote, how much do you trust each of the following? Or you haven't heard enough to say, the electoral commission. Only 9.8% of the population said they trusted the EC a lot, compared to 20.8 in 2019. 22.7 said they somewhat trusted the EC, compared to 32.1% in 2019. 27.3% said they trust the EC just a little, compared to 22.2% in, 22 in 2019. 0.5% said they don't know whether they trust the EC, compared to 77 in the 2019 report. And 39.7% said they don't trust the EC at all, compared to 189 in 2019. As an ordinary citizen relying on this data, I can safely conclude that there is an increase in public mistrust of the Electoral Commission. Such a decline of public trust is indeed worrying in an election cycle where the incumbent NPP claims they'll break the eight. And we in the NDC have unequivocally and clearly stated that do or die, we will win the December 2024 20, elections. <laughs> With all due respect, to the Electoral Commission and its chairperson. The decline in public trust is not surprising. In a country where elections are fiercely contested and often determined by a tiny margin, the admission of any error is bound to affect the credibility of the Electoral Commission. It did not require a soothsayer to predict this decline in trust in the aftermath of the 2020 elections when for the first time, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission publicly announced that she had inadvertently announced or used wrong numbers that led to the declaration of the presidential results, and then corrected them without involving the political parties or providing them with a clear explanation as to how this egregious mistake occurred. It is a fact that the 1992 Constitution created an independent electoral commission that is not subject to the direction or control of any person or authority, except as provided in the Constitution. This independence is critical to the functioning of the electoral commission and was enshrined in our Constitution to, one, insulate the commission from undue influence interference and manipulation for external, from external or internal forces, particularly political actors, as the doctor referred to, where they can create a stumbling block. And in that situation, then the EC will, of course, or ought to take a decision in favor of the public. Two, it was the, the independence was enshrined in our constitution to ensure that the commission carries out its functions transparently and fairly without fear or favor. It is, however, critical to understand that this independence has fetters. It is not limitless. The constitution makes the electoral commission subject to the principles of accountability, 
and other checks and balances enshrined in the 1992 Constitution. As much as the independence of the Electoral Commission is essential, these checks and balances are equally important. The principles of accountability and checks and balances help create a thriving democracy by ensuring that no, breach of gov no branch of government, agency, institution, or individual accumulates unbridled power. These principles help protect our democracy from abuse of power, tyranny, corruption, and the ultimate erosion of our democratic values. Now, one of the primary tools, and um, Doctor referred to the media and the problems associated with misinformation in social media, the um, impacts of AI and how uh, the media in recent times, you can't tell whether the appendages of political parties or not. So the media is one of those tools. But today I'm talking about another primary tool which was created by the 1992 Constitution for ensuring that the Electoral Commission remains transparent, fair, and accountable. Now, this is the oversight of the judiciary. The judiciary's role is critical for preserving the credibility of our electoral process. Citizens and political actors and political parties must be confident that they will receive justice in court in respect of alleged infractions of electoral laws by political actors or challenges to decisions by the Electoral Commission and that their constitutional right to vote will be pro protected. Proper oversight by the judiciary ensures that all actors in the electoral process comply with the legal framework governing elections. And that's why issues like judicialization of, the, of elections and um, politicization of the judiciary becomes very worrisome because the judiciary play a critical role in preserving our electoral process. However, as a practicing lawyer, reflecting on this critical role of the judiciary, it cannot be denied that over the years, the judiciary has delivered some pioneering or groundbreaking breaking decisions that have greatly improved accountability and transparency in the electoral process, and that the judiciary over the years have protected the constitutional right to vote. And at a later date, I'll discuss whether all is still well. But I would like to mention a few of these decisions, starting from 1996. In the Ten versus Attorney General and the Electoral Commission, case found in 1996 to 1997 Supreme Court of Ghana law report. The Supreme Court recognized that the conduct of the National Elections Commission, Electoral Commissioner in refusing to register the plaintiff and other qualified citizens would deprive them of their constitutional right to vote and ordered the National Electoral Commissioner to register the plaintiff and all those who qualify to be registered. The Supreme Court held that the exercise of this right of voting is indispensable in the enhancement of the democratic process and cannot be denied in the absence of a constitutional provision to that effect. In Apalu versus Electoral Commission of Ghana, 2001 to 2002, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, the Electoral Commission published a directive that for the purposes of the upcoming December 7, 2000 elections, only, only photo IDs would be accepted for voting in the general elections. The Supreme Court on December 4 declared the directive as unconstitutional and stated clearly that the courts should protect the right to vote at all costs. Otherwise, democracy in this country would be undermined. In the consolidated cases of Ahuma Okansi versus Electoral Commission and Center for Human Rights and Civil Liberties and Attorney General, found in the 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, 
and I, I'm sure many of us are aware of it, prisoner, prisoners were declared to have the right to vote in the absence of an electoral offense. And there are a host of other cases, Ajay Chum versus Attorney General in Akwete, 2005 to 2006, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, Appeal for Re and Attorney General, 2010, Supreme Court of, of Ghana Law Report, Kwesi Nyameti Association versus Electoral Commission, 2016, where the decisions of the Supreme Court relating to the collation forms for parliamentary and presidential elections enhanced the transparency, fairness, and accountability of the electoral process. After reading these cases, I could not help but agree with her ladyship, the then Chief Justice Georgina Theodora Wood, when she said in the Abu Ramadan case, that, and I quote, electoral justice is legitimately the most effective medium for the protection and preservation of the sovereign will of the people. A democratic principle explicitly captured in the preamble to the 1992 Constitution and implicitly reinforced under its Article 1. This critical role, universal adult suffrage and equal voting play in the democratic process cannot therefore be overlooked, end of quote. There are multiple factors for Ghana's ability to overcome the threat of electoral crisis. I would include in that list the crucial role of the judiciary in dispensing electoral justice, the propensity of the judiciary to fiercely protect the constitutional right to vote and enforce transparency accountability, and the rule of law in the electoral process. If we don't have that, that means people are going to go onto the streets to resolve their issues, which is not, is not an option. I guess this statement brings to the fore the tension between the advocates of judicial activism and scholars of the legal process theory, which will be a discussion for another day. But is everything rosy, hunky, and dory? Maybe this is where I get into trouble, but it has to be said. Not at all. The Afrobarometer survey I cited earlier suggests that all is not well. In addition, some recent actions of the Electoral Commission and decisions of the courts should give all of us cause for concern. And let me just mention a few. The previous speaker talked about a sizable, the fact that a sizable group of people should not be deprived of their right to vote or their representation for a long time. I'll go directly to the case, which is the electoral crisis of San Trokofi, Akpafu, Lipe, and Lulubi, popularly called Sao. It will, be called, it will be recalled that the Electoral Commission, through a press release published on the eve of the December 7, 2020 elections, directed the people of Sao not to vote in the parliamentary elections. However, they were allowed to vote in the presidential elections in the Buim constituency. To date, the people of Sao remain unrepresented, which is a clear violation of the constitution and the right of the people of Sao to vote and have representation in the eighth parliament. This is not just a cardinal sin, as aptly described by Professor Kukwasari. It is a tragedy. It is tragic that this should happen in our modern democracy, and we are all just looking or nothing is happening. I do not see how the creation of the Guan constituency to take effect in this eighth parliament could in any way be a breach of Article 47 of the 1992 Constitution when this predicament the people find themselves in has arisen because of a string of mistakes and omissions by state actors. I go to a second point, which has to do with presidential election petitions. The results of the presidential elections of both the 2012 and 2020 elections were challenged in the Supreme Court both petitions did not change the final result. However, one major difference between the two election petitions 
is that with regard to the judgment in the 2012 election petition, extensive recommendations were made by the esteemed justices of the Supreme Court, which led the Electoral Commission to commence some reforms. Now, in relation to the 2020 election petition, some aspects of the judgment give me cause for concern. For example, one of the complaints of the petitioner in the 2020 election petition was the manner in which the chairperson of the Electoral Commission on her own corrected errors she made in the computation of the presidential election results after she had issued the declaration of president-elect without consulting any of the presidential candidates in the 2020 elections. This is what the Supreme Court had to say of the complaint, and I quote, it has been argued on behalf of the petitioner that the chairperson of the first respondent could not have on her own corrected the error she made without consulting stakeholders in the 2020 presidential election. No statute or regulation was cited to us by council and our collective industry have revealed none. This submission does not find favor with the court in view of Article 297C of the 1992 Constitution, which, which provides thus, where power is given to a person or authority to do or enforce the doing of an act or a thing, all such powers shall be deemed to be also given as necessary to enable that person or authority to do or enforce the doing of the act or thing. End of quote. The issue raised by the petitioner was not whether the chairperson had the power to make corrections. The issue raised by the petitioner had to do with transparency, accountability, and fairness in the manner in which those corrections were made. Can the chairperson make such co corrections without first notifying the affected candidate of her error and, con and consulting them to correct it? The Supreme Court court says yes, the chairperson can in the absence of any statute or regulations that says she cannot. I find that unfortunate. Article 296A of the Constitution provides that discretionary power shall be deemed to imply a duty to be fair and candid. Article 296B also states that discretionary power should not be arbitrarily capriciously, should not be exercised arbitrarily, capriciously, and with bias. In fact, the entire fabric of the 1992 Constitution is built on the principles of accountability, transparency, and fairness. How will this play in the 2024 elections? I hope no <laughs> errors are made, but with this decision, how will this play if it happens again? A third point, the case of the five political parties versus the Electoral Commission, which was filed in September 7, 2023, in relation to the limited voter registration exercise. I have to give a bit of a history. The limited registration exercise was to commence on September 12 and end on October 2nd. The plaintiffs filed a writ in the Supreme Court on September 7 and promptly applied for an interlocutory injunction to restrain the EC from commencing the exercise pending the final outcome of the suit. After much noise and a public statement by one of the flag bearers of one of the plaintiffs, the court allocated a date for the hearing of the injunction in the application for injunction in October 2023 when the limited registration exercise would have commenced and concluded. Not surprisingly, on the scheduled date of the hearing of the application, neither plaintiffs nor their counsel turned up in court and the application for injunction was struck out. Her ladyship, the Chief Justice, explained that the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal do not have special dispensation to sit during the legal vacation and that was why the application injunction application was fixed for October 2023, when the courts would have resumed sitting. True, but rule one of the Supreme Court rules, which provides that sessions of the Supreme Court shall be held 
during term. Also provides that the court may sit at any other times directed by the Chief Justice. Is an application for injunction filed in September 2023 to restrain registration of voters commencing that same month not worthy of a special dispensation, special, not worthy of a special dispensation by her ladyship, the Chief Justice. Juxtapose this against a similar situation in 2012 in the case of Ransford France versus the Electoral Commission and the Attorney General, relating to the decision by the Electoral Commission to constitute 45 new constituencies resulting in the filing of the suit by the plaintiff in the Supreme Court on September 17, 2012, which was during the legal vacation, just like in the case of the five political parties. But this was in 2012. Together with the writ, the plaintiff filed an application to restrain Parliament from considering CI 73, which would establish new constituencies and restrain the EC from using the CI in its preparation towards the 2012 elections pending the final determination of the suit. The then Chief Justice immediately constituted a panel comprising a sole justice of the Supreme Court to determine the application for injunction, which was duly heard and determined on September 19. By October 4, 2012, the Chief Justice assembled a full panel to hear the substantive rate and judgment was delivered on October 19, 2012, one month after the writ had, had been filed. The Chief Justice at the time considered the situation urgent because it was an election-related matter. She considered it urgent enough to constitute the Supreme Court in 2012 during the legal vacation. What changed in 2023? My next point, and then I'll conclude. The decision by the Electoral Commission, and this is what I understand the decision is, to close the poll at 3 p.m. instead of the usual 5 p.m. and not to use indelible ink during the election. And these two decisions is already causing a ruckus and a stir all over. Changes to the electoral process are bound to happen, but these should prioritize inclusivity, protecting the right to vote, accessibility to the voting process, transparency, and fairness in counting the votes and the declarations. Now, how do these two decisions of the Electoral Commission achieve these objectives? How do they even arrive at this decision? Was it at IPAC? Was it with the political parties? I don't know. And um, we've already been told that regional coalition centers was, a re the decision to create regional coalition centers was retrogressive because it increases the point of manipulation. And um, this was actually laid in parliament. Parliament didn't pass it, but when you lay the CI in parliament and um, it's not, how do you call it? Um, Parliament does not vote rejecting it, then it passes into law. So that was what happened. Let me conclude my comments before I get into trouble by stating that any comments made today are not meant to denigrate the Electoral Commission or its chairperson, nor are they aimed at diminishing the administration of justice or the judiciary in the eyes of the public. I'm a lawyer and I practice in the courts. We will not achieve anything by denigrating them. Constructive criticism should be seen as a tool for growth and improvement, especially in 2024 with the upcoming elections and a sharply politically polarized country. It is my prayer that 2024 will see an increase in public trust in the elections process and the election management body, and that any lawsuits involving 2024 elections, because I'm sure they are bound to happen, will be treated as urgent and dealt with expeditiously. Finally, we should all remember that we have just one Ghana, and as said by Dr. 
we are obliged to engage in proper election behavior.